Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to the Epstein Project podcast. I want to take uh, this opportunity to talk about the women who enabled Jeffrey Epstein and who made it possible for a, a very large group of very powerful men like Prince Andrew, like Bill Clinton, like, it's just, there are so many powerful men, um, like Ehud Barak, for example, Alan Dershowitz, for these men to allegedly have um, abused what what appears to be, you know, well into the thousands of young girls. Um, As you know, I've just finished writing Ghislaine Maxwell, an unauthorized biography. And um, what attracted me to spending time looking at her early life is the fact that she's a woman. And while we we feel and we say and we think that women should be sort of like expected not to hurt other women and especially not to hurt children. And in fact, I just did a... I did a podcast with Greg Olier, and in it he he wanted to know you know why I selected uh, Ghislaine to to write about and what I saw in her. And again, it went back to well, she's a woman, and then intelligence agencies select women intentionally and and specifically older women uh, because they are more trusted. And what we have heard from the victims is by having Ghislaine around, she made the uh, abuse more normal. She normalized the abuse. And so she um, pretty much enabled uh, much more horrible things to happen. So I am going to discuss uh, some of the other women who have been uh, sort of part of this group, right? I mean, we don't just have Ghislaine Maxwell, although she sits at the very pinnacle of um, the pyramid who uh, hurt these women. So I have my notes here, and I want to be able to just find... um, these everybody's name so I could say it properly uh, so okay um, Ghislaine had assistants um, it wasn't just her driving around picking up children and uh, chasing after them and so these assistants are named Sarah Kellen Nadia Marcinkova Leslie Groff and Adriana Ross they're all, they were all named as unindicted co-conspirators in Epstein's 2008 non-prosecution agreement. Um, Kellen, Groff, and Ross were basically the women who scheduled and managed the girls coming in and out of the house. They collected contact information, they took messages, and they arranged the travel for the girls. Um, Sarah Kellen, who basically is known by a couple of names. One of them is Sarah Kensington. Uh, She was Epstein's personal assistant, and she's been described also as being Ghislaine Maxwell's lieutenant and being the second in command. Um, Many of the victims have said in court documents that she was very instrumental in their abuse, and she would, you know, open the door, and she would escort the children up into Epstein's room uh, early in the Palm Beach case when the police began investigating Jeffrey Epstein's behavior. Uh, they wanted an, uh, an arrest warrant for Sarah Kellen. And uh, then the Palm Beach County State Attorney's Office denied the request, basically saying there was insufficient evidence but um, one of the victims, in fact, Courtney Wilde, who, because of Courtney's just 
complete and focused dedication on seeking justice for herself and for everyone. And um, she's the one who started working with Bradley Edwards, and she's the one for whom there is a new law. And she just never gave up on, on sort of holding Jeffrey Epstein accountable. So for Courtney Wilde, what she remembers is that it was Sarah Kellen who, when she was only 14, with a mouthful of braces, um, Kellen's friendliness made the situation seem normal. You know, and basically, I'm going to quote here from an interview that um, Courtney gave. You're 14 years old, and you go to a mansion, and then Sarah Kellen, I mean, she's a beautiful woman, too. She's very nice, you know, escorts me upstairs. Uh, it's weird, but I just kind of went with the flow of what everyone else was doing. And in 19, uh, uh, sorry, in, in 2008, it's uh, important to note that Courtney Wilde sued the federal government for violating the rights of herself as well as Epstein's other victims by basically saying that the non-prosecution agreement, uh, and they did it behind their back, and they never told him that the case was ongoing. And, you know, she, 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 she just got up and said, no, you did something wrong. And the government initially, if you remember, agreed with her. And then that went up to a higher court. And wouldn't you know that then the government disagreed with her. But she has become a, a, an advocate for victims' rights. Uh, for victims' rights as soon as she sort of went public with her story. Um, after she was recruited, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell told her, well, you know what, you have another option. Instead of having the S word with Epstein, well, we can pay you to recruit other, other girls your age. Um, and basically, that's pretty much what Epstein was doing Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell were doing with all of the other girls. Um, during a raid in Jeffrey Epstein's house in 2005, the police found phone logs and they were signed by Sarah Kellen and it had the names of teenagers who were called for, quote, confirmation of work. Um, so basically he was running an enterprise, right? So And he was using as his primary source of where he got a lot of the girls, uh, Royal Palm Beach High School. Um, so if a girl uh, brought in a new friend to meet Jeffrey Epstein, that girl would get $200. And then word spread throughout the school. You know, these are young girls. They don't know necessarily what's right or wrong. A lot of them were from disadvantaged homes. Uh, in one case, uh, one girl, her mother was a drug addict. She was living with a relative, I believe, with her father and his new wife and her little brother, or or there was sort of like her stepbrother was killed in front of her. I mean, these girls were already, for the most part, highly traumatized, but they were still girls. They were still girls and they should have been left alone. Um, so for a lot of these girls, $200 was a big deal. $200 if you're 14, if you're, you know, you're very young, that's, that's a lot of money. I remember when I was 14, $200 seemed like, you know, I would be rich if I got $200. Um, so that for Courtney Wilde, who at the time was living in a trailer park, with a mother who did struggle with a problem, uh, an addiction problem, she basically thought she would become homeless if she didn't earn money. And the only way that presented itself for her to earn money was from Jeffrey Epstein. Um, so Sarah Kellen visited Epstein uh, many times, according to the prison records, uh, when he was in jail. And um, what's really... <laughs> Like everybody, including Ghislaine Maxwell, 
believes they too were a victim of Jeffrey Epstein. No, there comes a, there's a line in the sand. At one point, if you're an adult and you keep doing the wrong thing and you can't, like at some point there has to be a moment of reckoning even with yourself. So that um, Sarah Kellen has decided she is a victim and she went and she applied for uh, to be compensated from the Jeffrey Epstein Compensation Fund, uh, as did, by the way, Ghislaine Maxwell. Um, so the spokesperson for Sarah said when Sarah was targeted by Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, she, like many of their victims, was struggling financially and emotionally. Soon after Sarah was brought into Epstein's world, he began to sexually and psychologically abuse her, abuse that endured for years. Um, and although her representative basically said that, yes, Kellen did schedule appointments and massages for Epstein and Maxwell, but that she never, quote, recruited, end quote, girls for them. Um, I'm sorry, you're, you're basically leading the girls up into the room to be raped. You know, this has been said by m many, many of the victims. It would be Sarah that would call me and tell me to go to Epstein's room and that I had to service him because if I didn't service him, I would be punished. And who would met out that punishment? According to the victims, the person that would met out the punishment was Ghislaine Maxwell. All right, so let's talk about Nadia Marcinkova. Epstein would go around and say about Nadia, she is my sex slave. I bought her from her parents when she was 14 years old. This is something that has happened throughout the course of time, the purchasing of children from their very poor parents. Um, in other countries, we rarely hear about it happening in this country. And Nadia was not um, found in this country. She was purchased from her family, allegedly, in her country, which is Yugoslavia. Um, and she also visited Epstein when he was in jail, just shy of 60 times. Um, however, she has an attorney, and she too claims that she was victimized by Epstein. Now, in Nadia's case, it's my opinion that Nadia is a victim. That's my opinion. She was 14. She was purchased by her parents. Jeffrey Epstein basically became her mother and her father. I guess we can say that so did Ghislaine Maxwell, right? And uh, so she basically through her attorney, which she has not done to date, claims that she wants to speak out about her victimization and she wants to help Epstein's other survivors. Um, however, she has not said anything. I know that I've looked at her, sort of her fly girl website, because she, you know, she became an airline pilot um, and she sort of, learned to fly at a very young age and she like Ghislaine has a, a license to fly a plane uh, she had a website which was really interesting to see because it did have a sexual edge to it uh, the ads were very sensual in nature it, she wore a tiny little schoolgirl skirt and it was kind of really interesting especially at a time where basically your attorney is saying, I'm a victim and I want to come out and help Jeffrey Epstein's victims, except that you still have this website um, showing uh, something that was a little bit peculiar. Um, so the third woman I want to talk about is Adriana Ross. And uh, Adriana Ross has also used a different name I'm going to try to pronounce it. She's uh, Her last name is Musinska. So I'm going to spell that M-U-C-I-N-S-K-A. And basically, she doesn't want to respond or talk to anyone. She was an adult when she started to work 
with Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. And uh, she, like the other women, their salary, if I remember correctly, was either $200,000 a year or $250,000 a year. It was one of those two numbers. Um, but she also had the use of cars and she also had free travel and she also had, you know, uh, access to um, like free clothing. And there were a lot of perks that they didn't have to spend for out of pocket, you know, their, their hair, their makeup, their clothing, their housing in some cases was provided by Jeffrey Epstein. Don't forget that Jeffrey Epstein was given another property and in fact, many other properties, but in New York, uh, Leslie Wexner also provided the 301 East 66th Street location, which somehow ended up being property managed and now owned by Jeffrey Epstein's brother, Mark Epstein. And that was really the model's home. That's where a lot of these women lived and they were called models interchangeably with masseuses because both things really were code words for something, the S word, right? Um, so then there's Leslie Groff, who is closer in age to Ghislaine Maxwell. And she worked as Jeffrey Epstein's executive assistant uh, starting like from 20 years ago. And according to court documents uh, filed by Jennifer Arose, I'm going to spell her name A-R-A-O-Z. So it might be Jennifer Arose. Well, that's, I think I said it right. Um, it was Leslie Groff who facilitated Epstein's abuse in her case. Uh, she says that she looked after Epstein's victims, booked their travel, made sure they maintained what was in-house rules of behavior. Okay, so there were some rules of behavior in the homes where Jeffrey Epstein ruled with his queen, Ghislaine Maxwell, and on the island. These women, young women, and children were supposed to behave in a certain way and be available when they were called, uh, be available to be abused, pretty much. It's like, you know, yeah, come on over, he's ready or someone else is ready and we have a plane ticket for you and you're going to go here and when you get there you're supposed to have the s word with this person and you know i when you come back i want you to fill me in on what he said because men talk very loosely after they have the s word or before when they're trying to impress a girl and so that is how they were getting a lot of the blackmail information when it was not happening inside one of the homes that was, um, that had, you know, the closed circuit monitors and had the surveillance pinhole cameras. So, all right, in the case of um, Jennifer Arose, she accepted a payment from the victim's compensation fund and she had to then, of course, not sue any of the employees. Um, so let me see if I have any other notes that I want to share with you. Um, just give me a second, because I mean, you know, I think it's I think people forget how this happened. I know that every now and then I'll see a comment on Twitter. What about these girls' mothers? Where were they? You really. You, you, uh, the women and the people who say this, and primarily it's, I, I, sadly, it's women, um, don't understand that not everyone has a good mother and don't understand what poverty is, okay? Um, when a family has no money and primarily it's a single mother struggling with raising her children and has no money, yes, they're going to turn around and do anything in order. Survival is a very strong, um, it's just a very strong innate thing. You almost don't have a say in, in one struggle for survival. So 
a mother will uh, sacrifice one or more children. All you have to do is sort of compare it to Sophie's choice. All right. Meryl Streep played the role of Sophie's choice. Faced with losing one or both of her children, she selected one of them. And she, it's not like when we watch that movie, Sophie's Choice, it's pretty much the same. It's not like the mother or the father are not ups, upset over having had to sacrifice a child to a fate in some cases worse than death, you know, having to have your child be abused over and over again by strangers and used in this way is is a terrible thing. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the child's parent didn't care for the child, but circumstances beyond their control, and pretty much it's financial. Uh, that is why parents sometimes turn a blind eye. But in Jeffrey Epstein's case, what he did a lot of the time was he would purchase the child outright. He would just go ahead and give the family some money and say, okay, now this person belongs to me. He may not have told them what he was going to do with the child. You know, I've heard cases where he promised at, with Ghislaine at his side, Ghislaine pretending that she was his wife, that they were going to take care of her child and give the child um, a great education and really look after her. And then, of course, once the child was away from, from the parents, then the abuse would begin, and by then it was too late. Because, you know, there were threats made, I'm going to kill your mother, I'm going to kill your brother, I'm going to kill this. The threats were continuous. And they, the, these threats didn't just come from Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. These threats came also from the local police department. They were also on the payroll. And these threats, believe it or not, they came from people like Prince, Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton, who threatened Grayton Carter, uh, the publisher of Vanity Fair. There were threats up and down the line across the board, which is why all these many years later in 2021, instead of 2005, 2005, that's why we're now talking about this case because all, all of these threats and everybody being afraid, literally afraid to say anything. We still don't know how many people were killed because of this. There were companies like Black Cube that were employed. There were private eyes that were employed. There were bad people that were employed to make sure that nobody talked, to make sure that they continued to um, keep the fear in these children who later became adults uh, if they survived uh, into the people who knew in their circle, the people who knew, everybody was, everybody was threatened. So, um, you know, there are like a lot of factors. It's not a black and white thing. It's all shades of gray in this situation. Um, so let me just see if I have any other thoughts and things to add to this, because I didn't want to talk about the women who have been um, complicit with Jeffrey Epstein. Another one would be Eva Anderson. Uh, supposedly, she was Jeffrey Epstein's former girlfriend, although in my opinion, Jeffrey Epstein did not have girlfriends. I, again, I'm going to say that Ghislaine Maxwell was not his girlfriend. She was his partner in crime. She was his alleged madam. They did not have a normal relationship. They Nobody saw them holding hands or kissing or anything like that. They would interact in that way when they were abusing a child or when they were having the group situation on the island with, you know, very, very famous and notable people. Um, so, but Eva Anderson Dubin, who is a former Miss Sweden and is now the wife of Glenn Dubin, 
who's a finan who's a who's a billionaire and who was born poor as Jeffrey Epstein in Brooklyn but suddenly he's a billionaire so I haven't gone down that rabbit hole because I've been too busy going down a lot of other rabbit holes if you are the rabbit hole type I suggest hey you know what there's Glenn Dubin go down that rabbit hole find out his story how did he get all that money yeah, I'll give you one clue, Jeffrey Epstein. In any event, um, Eva Dubin, at the time that uh, Jeffrey Epstein was being prosecuted, sent a wonderful uh, testimony uh, to the police on behalf of Jeffrey Epstein. And basically she said, I could not ask for a better friend or a godfather to my children. Um... She basically said that she was 100% comfortable having him around her children. And then uh, after Epstein finished his jail sentence, and I'm not even going to get into it because we can't really even call it a jail sentence. It was that lenient. He spent the first Thanksgiving after his release at uh, the Dubin's Palm Beach house. So she's another female that enabled um, the abuse so again, you know, there are a, a lot of women who enabled the abuse. And we forget that women um, do turn on other women. We see it on social media all the time. We see a cattiness among women, between women. And, and, and I'm going to say, let's, let's make an effort to stop this. We really have to make an effort to just... Um, build a better place, build a better world for our sisters. Because, you know, we're all basically in the same boat here. We need to have a safer place, a place where predatory behavior is neutralized. And we can't do that if we're always bickering and fighting with each other. So let's be kinder to each other. Let's stop the cattiness. Let's be supportive. And, and let's continue to make sure that women who do not follow the rule of um, that I'm basically laying out, it just, just, just be kind. You know, you don't have to get along with everyone. I don't get along with everyone. And, and I'm not saying that you should either. It's impossible to get along or to like everyone. But you don't have to put somebody down. Okay, we can all coexist in the same place and we can all fight toward the same goal. Uh, and our goal is to get rid of predatory behavior for our, ourselves and our children and our grandchildren and the, the children that come afterwards. Because don't remember, little boys are also molested all right that our children are safe and and that begins with a woman so if women are not around to facilitate this and to make things seem normal so that a man can get someone to do something that they're not comfortable with and in this case this was a very high up operation again Alexander Acosta did not say I was told to back off Jeffrey Epstein because he belonged to intelligence for no reason so this was an operation that that is called a honeypot operation. All the governments have this, but we don't want this in our government anymore. It's enough. I mean, seriously, enough is enough. We have enough crime, enough violence, no more of this. You can't use our children and you can't use our, our vulnerable women. I know because I was one of these vulnerable women, but I'm not any longer. But we can't use vulnerable women and children so that we can get secrets from some powerful guy. That's why you have computers. Use your computers, okay? Don't use don't use people anymore. In any event, um, that's going to wrap up my sort of compilation on the women who were complicit in Jeffrey Epstein's scheme. Uh, the one that was facilitated primarily by Ghislaine Maxwell, who was currently sitting in a Brooklyn jail, where I hope she continues to sit forever. 
All right, well, this is Kirby Summers for the Epstein Project podcast. Please like the video, like the video. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.